uh, just say something in the chat box. Okay, great. It sounds like you can hear and see me, no problem. Uh, well, Henry, thank you so much for getting us started and for the introduction. Uh, and thank you uh, to all of you uh, for coming today to participate in the webinar. I'm really looking forward uh, to sharing some of my thoughts with you, uh, but also I'm really looking forward uh, to hearing your ideas and your experiences. And I think uh, that's what's fantastic about webinars. Um, you also get to participate. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, so as Henry said, uh, today's webinar is about developing essential skills for academic success. Uh, and I'm Mike Boyle, and I am one of the authors of the Skillful series uh, published by Macmillan. Uh, I helped write the reading and uh, list, sorry, the reading and writing students book four, uh, as well as the level three listening and speaking book. Uh, and my background is, I think, pretty interesting and gives me an interesting perspective uh, on today's topic because uh, I have had the opportunity to teach uh, English as a foreign language and English as a second language uh, to learners in Japan, uh, in China, and uh, from many different countries uh, here in New York. Uh, and then I've also had the opportunity to teach uh, a university-level writing course uh, at the University of Iowa here in the United States. So I've seen firsthand uh, that there is a pretty big difference between uh, what we expect of students in an English language university classroom uh, versus what we, uh, what the students are used to uh, from schools and cultures uh, in their own country. Uh, so today, uh, what I want to talk about is what teachers expect uh, their students to be able to do uh, in an English language university classroom. Uh, and then we'll also talk about the skills that you can help your students develop so that they'll meet those expectations successfully. Great, so uh, let's talk about, to start with, we are going to talk about the differences in expectations. Let's talk about what university teachers uh, expect uh, from students. And I think it's important to notice that it's not just uh, a different uh, it's not just a different classroom uh, that students have to get used to it's a different culture and a different set of expectations uh, and I know from my teaching experience that's true for uh, native speaker students who are transitioning from secondary school to university and it's also true for English language learners who are moving to a university environment that might be uh, in a new culture uh, so your students have to adjust to uh, not just to a, a new language, but also new expectations about uh, how they interact with their peers, how they interact with the professor, and then also how they think about what they read and hear uh, in the assigned material. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I have uh, here on the screen uh, pictures of two different classrooms. Uh, as you can see, classroom A is from the National Insurance Academy in India. Uh, and classroom B is from Shimer College, which is a small college uh, near Chicago in the United States. Um, so take a minute and look at these pictures, and then in the chat box, tell me, how are these pictures different? What's different about these two classrooms? Uh, you might want to think about, uh, is it formal? Is it informal? Who's talking and who's listening? The setting is different. Yes, uh, as someone is saying now, the uniforms are different. Right, in classroom B, we see students working as a group. It's a conference versus a lecture. In A, the teacher is only talking. B is more student-oriented, as you say. OK, a lot of excellent ideas here on the chat box. The interactions are very different. Uh, and I think it's, it's not just uh, the interactions, it's not just the level of formality and informality. I also think it's the way uh, that the teachers, or sorry, it's also uh, the content of what students are being expected to say, and also the way they're expected to think about uh, what they're hearing and reading. So, okay, so quickly, as you can see, the question asks, which classroom 
are your students more used to? Which are they more familiar with? Is it A or B? Uh, so quickly, we can't do a poll, but just type A or B in the chat box. OK, I see some both mix of A and B, a lot of A's, and also a lot of B's, which is good. I'm glad to hear that. OK, A and B, A. OK, great. Well, thank you so much for uh, your input on that. Um, I think that it's interesting that we've got a great mix of participants here. Uh, your students are used to uh, both environments, but then we also have some of you uh, whose students are more familiar with uh, Classroom A. So I think um, what we'll talk about today is the skills that your students need uh, to succeed, uh, not just in Classroom A, uh, but also in Classroom B. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, in order to succeed in both of those environments, uh, your students uh, need more than just basic skills. Uh, so here you can see the basic skills that your students will need uh, in Classroom A. They need to read and understand. They need to listen and understand. And then they need to understand the lectures. Um, but to be successful in both classrooms, A and B, uh, they need those basic skills plus new skills. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about those plus skills that they need. So they need to read, plus they need to read critically. Uh, they need to listen, plus they need to be active listeners. Uh, and they need to not just understand lectures, uh, but also to participate uh, successfully in discussions. So today, uh, I'd like to talk about each of those three plus skills and some ways that you can help your students uh, be more confident and successful with those skills. So first of all, uh, let's talk about critical reading. Critical reading uh, is the first of the three plus skills uh, that we're going to talk about today. Uh, so I'd like to do a poll uh, to find out about your teaching situation. Uh, as you can see, uh, on this screen, there is uh, a statement in the bubble, uh, which is a common attitude students have about reading. The text is always right, and my job as a student uh, is to remember the information in the text. Uh, so if you can use the polling button, uh, don't use the chat box this time. We have a special button for this. How many of your students uh, think this way? Is it nearly all of them? Uh, most of them, some of them, or very few of them. OK, so I see some of you are using the chat box, which is great. But if you can actually use uh, the polling function uh, near your name, that will be great, because then Henry can give us the results. OK, great. I'll just give you a little, a few more moments to cast your votes. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of A's, B's, and C's. Uh, not that many D's. Okay, great. And Henry has the results on the screen. Uh, so we can see here the most popular answer for those of you who voted is a B, uh, that most of your students uh, have this attitude to reading. Uh, and of course, I want to say uh, what we see in that bubble is sort of the basic skill of reading, reading for information uh, and reading and understanding. Uh, and that's OK. You do need that skill of reading uh, to succeed in an academic environment. Um, but you also need uh, the plus skill, which is critical reading. Uh, so a way to think about critical reading is that uh, in basic reading, uh, we look for information about a topic. Uh, but in critical reading, uh, we're reading in order to discover new ways of thinking about a topic, new perspectives on the topic. So we're not just absorbing information. We're reading in order to have ideas about a topic. So what does that mean in detail? Well, uh, here are some things that people do uh, when they are reading critically. And uh, I'll talk about each of these uh, one by one. And I'll give you some ideas of things you can uh, very easily do in your classes to help your learners develop these skills. Uh, so we'll talk about the skill of making inferences. Uh, we'll talk about considering sources of information, uh, identifying or telling the difference between facts, speculation, uh, and opinion. 
uh, and also the skill of evaluating arguments. Uh, those are some of the main uh, aspects of critical reading. So let's start with uh, making inferences. Uh, this is an important part of critical reading. Uh, we sometimes call this reading between the lines. Uh, and what we mean by making inferences is that uh, you're looking for information uh, that isn't directly say, stated in the text. It's not explicitly stated, uh, but the information is there uh, if you look carefully, uh, particularly at the choices of words that writers make. Uh, and sometimes it's information, uh, sometimes it's an attitude, and sometimes it's an opinion. Uh, we have here an example activity uh, from Skillful, uh, and this is something that you can easily do uh, with any reading text uh, that you assign. Uh, as you can see, we're teaching them a little bit about the skill of making inferences and, and showing them that if you look carefully uh, at the word choices that a writer makes, uh, you can see uh, their opinion, even if it's not directly stated. Uh, for example, in this sentence, uh, which is about businesses that don't try to make changes, uh, you can see that the writer uh, is implying uh, criticism of these businesses because he uses this word, fail. It says the need to change is obvious, and yet businesses around the world fail to actively work toward change. Uh, the writer could have said uh, businesses around the world don't actively work towards change, uh, but by using the word fail, uh, we can infer that the writer is criticizing those businesses. So uh, when you assign reading uh, to your learners, you can easily help them develop the skill of making inferences and finding inferred criticism. Uh, if you just take uh, a few minutes before class uh, and look for some places in the text, maybe one paragraph uh, where there are inferences, and then have your students look at that paragraph uh, and, and have them try to infer the author's opinion or infer uh, any attitude or criticism that the author has. Uh, and then, of course, it's very important then uh, to follow that up by asking them which words help you. Uh, so that uh, students can make the connection between a writer's word choices uh, and the attitudes or opinions that uh, you can infer from those choices. Okay, so that's the first uh, area of critical reading that you can help your students with. Um, another important area uh, that we're going to talk about today is considering sources uh, of information. Uh, so again, we talked about the difference between basic reading uh, and critical reading. In basic reading, uh, you're trying to understand and remember information. Uh, in critical reading, we're questioning that information. So instead of just uh, absorbing the information, uh, we're asking ourselves, is this information accurate? Uh, is this information valuable? Is this information up to date? Um, so this is something that you can easily uh, help your, your students become confident and successful in doing. Uh, anytime you assign a reading text that has a lot of information from different sources, have them go through the text and just identify for each fact uh, where it comes from. And this is an activity uh, that we have in Skillful that has them do uh, just that. The students have read uh, a really interesting article about memory. Uh, and whether memory is reliable. And this list here of the sentences one through seven, these are all facts that come from the reading. And we're asking them to go back into the text and identify the source of the information. Uh, and it's important to note that sometimes no source is given. Uh, and that's a very important clue in critical reading. Uh, if a fact does not have a source of information, uh, we have to wonder about that. So you can easily do this with your own reading text uh, just take a few minutes before class uh, to identify five or six facts and then have your students look for the sources. Or if you don't have time to do that, uh, you can just say to your students, work in pairs and find three, four, five pieces of information and say where their sources are. Uh, and then once they've done that, uh, have them discuss those information sources. This is the really important part. This is where the critical thinking begins. And ask them, do you think that sources of information are credible. Uh, maybe the fact comes from a respected scientific journal, or maybe it comes from a random website, or maybe it comes from uh, the author's personal experience, but it's not uh, based on research. Maybe there's no source at all. 
Uh, and then, of course, we also talk about whether these sources are appropriate for what they're reading. Uh, are the sources okay for a news report or a personal essay? Perhaps, but maybe those sources aren't good enough uh, for an academic essay. And so this is something that you can easily do, uh, you know, whenever you have a reading text that would work with this activity. And it will help your students uh, become more confident and successful uh, in critical reading. Uh, and then similar to that is the skill of identifying fact, speculation, uh, and opinion. Uh, and again, here we're questioning the information uh, in the text. And I think it's important for EAP students to remember uh, that uh, sometimes a sentence that looks like a fact actually is an opinion. And you know, in the early levels, we always teach our students uh, that you know, opinions begin with expressions like, I think, or in my opinion, or I believe. Uh, but in a lot of higher level texts, writers do not use those words uh, when they give their opinion. Uh, for example, in uh, sentence four here, uh, you can see the writer simply says, uh, we are clearly fortunate that the healer's language had not yet vanished. Uh, and that phrase, clearly fortunate, uh, shows uh, that the writer is giving an opinion, uh, but it looks a lot like a fact. Uh, so this is something that learners need to be uh, comfortable with and confident in. Uh, in the same way in sentence five, uh, the highlighted phrase is thought to be. This shows that uh, this is not a fact, that it's speculation. It's a theory, but we don't know yet whether it's true. It's just something we think. Uh, so again, um, when you assign reading in your class, uh, you can very easily uh, have your students work on this skill uh, by giving them uh, a paragraph uh, or a couple of paragraphs in the text and have them identify lines that are fact, uh, speculation, or opinion, and then, of course, ask them which words uh, show them that it's fact, speculation, or opinion. Uh, and then, finally, the last part of critical reading uh, that I'll talk about today is evaluating arguments. Uh, so up to now, we've talked about questioning information uh, in the text. Uh, another part of critical reading is questioning the logic in the text or questioning the reasoning in the text. Uh, and this is a big thing I think that a lot of students don't know to expect uh, because they've been told in the past that uh, the text is always correct and their job is just uh, to remember it. Uh, but in an academic setting, in English language university classes, uh, teachers are going to expect students uh, to question the logic uh, that they see in the things that they read. Uh, so one way we can do that, uh, first of all, is by explaining to students what an argument is. An argument just means uh, this is a way of showing, this is just a way of uh, convincing someone of your opinion. Uh, argument is a way of just uh, trying to be persuasive. And so uh, it's important to point out that an argument is an opinion plus reasons and evidence. Uh, so in other words, if you say uh, smoking is bad, that's just an opinion. Uh, but if you say smoking is bad uh, because it causes lung cancer, uh, that's an argument. It's an opinion plus reasons. So what you can do uh, to help your students learn the skill of evaluating arguments is you can teach them about some common mistakes uh, that writers make in reasoning. Uh, and in Skillful Students Book 4, uh, Reading and Writing 4, there are three uh, mistakes in reasoning that we call logical fallacies, uh, which we teach. Uh, and each of them is evident here in the arguments on the screen. So have a look at uh, one, two, and three. And let's talk about each one. Tell me what the problem is. Uh, for example, number one, the reasoning here has a problem. No one saw him leave his house, uh, so he must have been home all night. Uh, tell me in the chat box, what's the problem here? Okay, order, lack of evidence, no evidence. Okay, there is evidence. The person is giving evidence by saying no one saw him leave his house. Right, where's the evidence that he was home, Bernadette, exactly. Maybe he wasn't home at all. We just don't know. 
Okay, let's talk quickly about number two. Here in number two, people say, most drivers involved in car accidents are right-handed. Therefore, being right-handed causes car accidents. What do you think? What is the, what is the problem here? Right, as Constantine says, most people are right-handed. It's a generalization. It is false logic. Right, how do they know they were using their right hand? That's a, that's a very interesting point. Right, it's false. It's definitely false logic. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> okay, it's driver's vision being drunk. There are other things that cause accidents. Uh, it's not just being right-handed. Okay. Uh, Thank you for your input. Those are really good points. Uh, let's quickly talk about number three. In argument number three, uh, they say test scores increased after the school repainted the hallways. Uh, so therefore, when you change the color, uh, it affects the student's test performance. So it's an argument. There's evidence and there's an opinion. Uh, but the reasoning uh, has a problem. Right? As Sheila says, it could be a coincidence. No proven connection as they're testing to support this claim. Very good, Constantine. I, I agree with that. Students should learn better to get a higher score. We don't know the background. All right? Did they change the color? Let's say they changed the color. All right? There's no evidence. It's confusing linking. Okay, you guys are great. You guys are very, very excellent logicians uh, and analyzers of arguments already. So I think your students are very, very lucky to have your support in class. So these are the three logical fallacies. There are many more logical fallacies, but these are three that we teach and that I think you can easily, easily teach your students. And these are common mistakes in reasoning that we see uh, again and again and again. Uh, the first one is what we call uh, argument from ignorance. And that is uh, just because something has not been proven false uh, doesn't mean that it's true. Uh, so just because we don't have evidence that he left his house, that's not enough. Um, so that's why this number one is an example of the mistake of argument from ignorance. Uh, because we don't have evidence, uh, therefore it must be true. And it doesn't really make sense. As many of you said, you need evidence. Uh, and then the second fallacy is what we call confusing correlation uh, and causation. And that's just saying that if two things happen at the same time, uh, you cannot assume uh, that one caused the other. So as many of you said, uh, it's ridiculous. Just because uh, you happen to be right-handed when you get in a car accident, uh, that doesn't mean that being right-handed causes car accidents. Uh, the reason why most, uh, most car accidents involve right-handed people is because most people are right-handed. It's, it's, not, it's not a cause relationship. It's just a statistical correlation. Uh, and then the last fallacy is what we call after, therefore, because. Uh, and that just means uh, you, just because X happened before Y, uh, that doesn't mean that X caused Y. And so that's, you know, as many of you said, uh, just because the, the paint was changed before the test, that doesn't mean that the paint uh, had an effect on the test results. There's no connection. So those are three uh, logical fallacies that I think you can very easily uh, teach your students. And they're the kind of problems that we very often see uh, in texts, in uh, opinion articles, and even in uh, academic texts that your students uh, will read. So I think the best way for you to introduce this to your students is by pointing them out in the texts, uh, of course, and then after that, having your students look for them uh, in the assigned reading that you give them. And if you do that, uh, they'll become much more confident in this skill, uh, which their teachers are going to expect from them uh, in English language university classes. And I think if all of these things are put together, uh, the skills we've just talked about, then over time, uh, your students are going to become very strong critical readers uh, and very confident. And they'll be very, very glad uh, that you've uh, prepared them to be successful in uh, university classes. So, that was the uh, first of the plus skills, critical reading. Uh, so there's two more skills I want to talk about. Uh, we'll spend a little less time on those because I know uh, we have about an hour. So the next skill is active listening. Uh, and let's start again by thinking about the difference between basic listening uh, and active listening. So we've got a poll here. 
Uh, think about your students. Uh, when they listen to something, a news report, a video, uh, whatever it is, what is most important to them? Is it understanding the main ideas? Is it remembering as many details as possible? Uh, deciding if they agree with the speakers uh, or connecting the ideas they hear to other ideas. So this may be different than uh, what you assign them to do. Uh, but when they're listening, what are they really worried about? What is their, what is their main goal? Okay, so I'm seeing uh, mostly A's and B's, understanding the main ideas uh, and remembering as many details as possible. Okay, yes, many, many A's and B's here. Thank you to all of you for participating in this. Uh, it's so fantastic to hear your point of view. Oh, great, and Henry has put the results on the screen. Uh, so I think that's all you can see now. Uh, of those of you who participated in the poll, um, almost everyone chose uh, either A or B. Uh, so um, I think we know now that uh, A and B are things that you do need to do uh, when you listen. It is important to understand the main ideas, and it is important to remember important details. And that's the basic skill of listening. Um, we talked about basic skills and plus skills. Now, basic skills are important, uh, but you also need the plus skill uh, to be successful in an academic environment. And C and D are part of the plus skill of active listening. Uh, when we listen actively, we decide if we agree with the ideas, and we think about how those ideas might be related uh, to other things, other texts, uh, other theories, or other ideas uh, that we're working with in the class. So let's talk about active listening uh, in detail. And these are things that active listeners do. Uh, and again, we'll talk about uh, some ways that you can help your students develop these skills. Uh, they infer attitudes. Uh, and that's very similar to uh, the inferences that they do when they read. Uh, they're aware of the speaker's point of view, uh, which may mean uh, how, the speaker, uh, how the speaker's opinion is influenced by uh, their job or other parts of the context. Uh, and then uh, applying ideas to other situations. Uh, that is an important skill in academics. It's also an important TOEFL skill. Uh, and it's important in other exams as well. And then, of course, you'll listen to think of ideas uh, to add to the discussion. So uh, what I'd like to do now is we'll go through these skills and talk about things you can do uh, to help your students uh, become more confident uh, with those skills. Uh, so the first is inferring attitudes. And uh, we talked about this for reading uh, and the importance of looking at the uh, writer's word choices uh, to understand their attitude. And when you are listening or watching a video, uh, you can also use the word choices to understand the speaker's attitude. Uh, in addition to that, uh, intonation, uh, the sound of their voice, is very, very important. And this may be something that you want to model for your students. And for example, even, even with just one word, uh, like the word really, uh, intonation can tell us a lot about attitude. Uh, for example, if someone says to you, oh, you got a new job, really? What they just mean is, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about it. So their attitude is they're interested. Uh, but if somebody says to you, you couldn't turn in your homework because your dog ate it, really? That intonation shows skepticism. So we can see that intonation is a very important indicator of attitude. Uh, and whenever you have your students listen to uh, or watch anything where uh, there are opinions expressed, uh, you can use a simple activity to have them in for attitudes. Uh, what we do in Skillful uh, Listening and Speaking Students Book 4 is we give the students uh, three options. And they listen and decide which uh, word best describes the speaker's attitude, uh, apologetic, abrupt, or passionate uh, in this example. Uh, and you can easily do this uh, for anything that you have your students listen to uh, where inferences are important. So have them listen uh, and just choose a, a word that best describes the speaker's attitude. And then, of course, this is very important. Then have them give evidence uh, for why they feel that way. Is it the intonation? 
is it the tone of voice, uh, and so forth. So if you do this regularly, your students will uh, become very comfortable and very confident in inferring attitudes, and that's an important active listening skill. Uh, we also have the skill of awareness of point of view. Uh, you know, in basic listening, uh, we're listening and we're asking ourselves, uh, what is the speaker's opinion? Uh, in active listening, we're asking ourselves, why does the speaker have that opinion? Uh, so that could mean uh, the speaker's reasons for the opinion, but also uh, you ask yourself, how does the speaker benefit from this issue? How is the speaker harmed, possibly, by the issue? Uh, so one way to do that uh, is if you have your students listening to anything that's a debate or a news program, uh, have them listen for the speaker's jobs or the organizations uh, that the speakers are associated with. Uh, and then have them listen for the speaker's opinions as well. Uh, and from that, you can ask your learners, how do you think uh, the people's jobs affect their opinions? Uh, for example, here in Skillful, uh, Listening and Speaking Students Book 3, uh, the students are listening to a news report about a genetically modified food. Uh, and there are some people in the debate who uh, belong to companies that manufacture genetically modified food, and then there are some people who will uh, be harmed by genetically modified food. Their businesses will suffer. Uh, and so we're asking students to see the connection between uh, the people's jobs, uh, the profit they stand to make, uh, the money they stand to lose, and the way that affects their opinion. Uh, so that's something you can easily draw your students' attention to uh, whenever there is a, a news report or other debate uh, that you're going to have them listen to. Okay, and then another aspect of uh, active listening uh, is the idea of applying theories. Uh, and this means that you take the ideas uh, in the text and you show how they relate uh, to other texts or to other issues. Uh, and as you know, this is an important exam skill. Uh, if your students are planning on taking the TOEFL exam, uh, they will need to listen to a passage uh, and then read a passage on the same subject and then write something that makes connections between them. Uh, so it's important to help your students get confidence in this. Uh, one way to do this is, uh, if you have a few minutes before class, think of some real life situations uh, that relate to the ideas or theories uh, which are being discussed uh, in the listening text. And then have your students listen for those ideas, make sure they understand the ideas and theories, and then give them uh, the situations and ask them which theories or which ideas apply to them. Uh, so for example, uh, here in uh, Skillful Listening and Speaking Students Book 4, uh, there is a, a listening passage on group dynamics theory, uh, and that's just different ideas about how groups develop. Uh, for example, how students in the same class uh, get to know each other and form a group identity over the course of one term. Uh, and the reading has a few uh, theories on how groups form. Uh, and so what we've done is we've given them some real life situations, like this one. I'm a bit nervous. We're all talking to each other a bit nervously, uh, but at least we can get some work done this time. And then we're asking our students, which theory that you just heard uh, relates to this situation? So again, this is something that you can very easily do uh, with your own students if you have a few minutes before class uh, to think of some situations and ask them to apply the ideas uh, to those situations. Okay, so we've now talked about two of the three uh, plus skills, uh, critical reading uh, and also active listening. And so the third skill uh, that I want to talk to you about today uh, that your students will need to succeed in an academic environment uh, is class participation. Uh, so let's start by uh, hearing from you about uh, your students' attitude to class participation. Uh, so Henry is uh, going to manage this poll for us. Uh, and what I want you to do is look at the statement uh, here on the screen. This is a student talking. Uh, the teacher's job in class is to talk, and the student's job is to listen. It's not appropriate for students to add their own ideas. So how many of your students would agree with this statement? Is it A, nearly all, uh, B, most, C, some, or D, very few? 
Okay, this is great. We're seeing a lot of C and D answers, which is fantastic, because uh, I think that means you've already done, you've already been doing a really great job in preparing your students to participate in class. Uh, and students want to participate uh, and expect to participate, and I think that's really fantastic. Uh, your students are very lucky to have you uh, encouraging them in this way. Uh, and Henry's put the results up now, uh, so you can see that most of you say uh, that Actually, most of you have said that very few of your students have this attitude, uh, which I think is fantastic. Uh, and then some of you say some do, uh, but not very few of you say that uh, most of your students do. Uh, so I think that's great uh, because it's important for students to know uh, that their teachers expect them to participate in class and they expect them to add their views. Uh, so here are some things that uh, class participation here are some parts of class participation that teachers expect uh, in an English language university setting. Uh, they want you to ask to clarify or confirm ideas you hear. Uh, and that's just a way of saying uh, your students need to make sure uh, that they understand correctly what they're hearing. Uh, and that could be something that their teacher says, or it could be something uh, that their classmates say. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, you'll also need the skill of politely interrupting. Um, and I think it's important uh, that students uh, feel comfortable doing this, uh, and also at the same time, students need to know uh, in each class uh, how the teacher wants to be interrupted. There are some teachers who would rather save questions until the end, uh, and there are some teachers who would rather uh, answer questions uh, as they go. Um, and it's important for you as the teacher to create uh, an interruptions policy in your class uh, so that your students have uh, real practice in interrupting politely uh, in order to make a point. Uh, and then another skill here is adding information to a discussion. And when you add information to a discussion, uh, you need to be able to uh, give your own view, uh, to give your own argument, and you also need to analyze the arguments of others. That's the kind of contribution teachers expect at the university level. Uh, so I think um, it's important for your students to know uh, that teachers uh, are going to expect them to do those things. And I think it's fantastic that most of your students already understand uh, that that's expected of them. I think that's great. Uh, the other thing they need uh, is the language to do that. Uh, and you can help them with this, I think, tremendously uh, by bringing uh, some classroom language uh, into your class. And I think uh, we all remember teaching uh, A1 or A2 classes where we have a lot of uh, basic classroom language. What's this in English? Can you repeat that? Uh, really simple stuff. Um, and almost every teacher uh, has classroom language in the lower levels and makes a point of teaching it and having it somewhere for the students to see. Uh, but I think uh, when students reach the intermediate level, uh, sometimes we forget about classroom language. Uh, but I think to help your students feel confident participating in class, uh, it helps to bring back uh, what I would call academic classroom language. So uh, these are expressions that will help your students participate in class uh, effectively and successfully uh, in the ways that their teachers are going to expect. Uh, so I'm going to give you a, a few sets of academic classroom language um, with different purposes. And I think for each one, you know, what you can do is, uh, before a speaking exercise, uh, put these on the board. Uh, maybe one day you'll do expressions to clarify or confirm what you heard. And maybe another day you'll do uh, expressions for politely interrupting. And maybe another day you'll do uh, another set of expressions. Um, what I would do is I would put these on the board uh, before a group activity. Uh, and model them for your students uh, so they're comfortable with the pronunciation and intonation. Uh, and then as you are working with your students during the activity, uh, encourage them to use uh, this language. Uh, and then finally, in the case of asking to clarify and confirm, uh, when, the, uh, when the activity is finished, uh, you can have a question and answer session uh, with your students so that they have practice using these expressions uh, not only with their peers, uh, but also with you. And so it's a chance for them to actually clarify or confirm uh, the things that they heard uh, from you. So it will help their comprehension and also help their uh, class participation skills. Uh, and then here's more classroom language uh, on the subject of politely interrupting. 
Uh, and again, I think I've mentioned this already, but it's good for you to uh, give your students uh, a clear policy uh, about interruptions in your class. Um, encourage it, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, if there are times when you want them to practice interrupting, uh, let them know uh, that this is a good time to do it. Uh, and again, have them become comfortable with these expressions. You can put them on the board uh, ahead of time, model them, you know, and then encourage them to use them in the activity uh, and in general in class. Uh, and then we also have the skill of adding information to uh, a discussion. And again, these are uh, expressions that you can give your students before a group speaking activity, uh, model them, uh, encourage them to use them during the activity, and then again, have a discussion uh, with the class uh, and encourage them to use these expressions in a larger group discussion because that's uh, the sort of setting in uh, an actual English language academic class uh, that they'll need to use these expressions. Okay, so those are all things that students can say uh, at the beginning of their turn in a class discussion. Uh, but then what? Uh, because uh, those expressions are just the beginning of the sentence. You have to finish the sentence with your idea. And of course, uh, university teachers are going to expect uh, a certain quality of ideas uh, that maybe some students aren't used to. I think students often want to just give a personal opinion uh, or they just want to share a personal experience. Uh, but what teachers really want at the university level is they want students to give arguments. And remember, we discussed that argument is an opinion plus evidence or an opinion uh, plus reason. And also students need to become comfortable analyzing and talking about uh, the arguments that other people make. So you can uh, help your students become confident in this uh, by giving them practice actually giving uh, these sorts of ideas. Uh, so that means that the discussion questions uh, that you choose after a reading or a listening are very important. Uh, and if you choose good discussion questions, um, your students will uh, have a lot of practice and confidence uh, giving the sorts of ideas that their teachers expect. Uh, so I will show you some examples uh, in a minute of discussion questions that I think are successful. Uh, but here are some criteria. Uh, I think effective discussion questions ask students to analyze the reasoning in a text. Uh, they ask them to consider more than one side of an issue. Uh, they ask students to, as I said, give arguments uh, and not just opinions and go beyond their personal uh, experience. Um, so let me give you uh, some examples from Skillful of discussion questions that I think uh, achieve those goals. And you can very easily uh, use these ideas in your own discussion questions uh, in your classes. Uh, for example, for question number one, uh, there's two parts to the question. And the first part says, do you agree with uh, the writer uh, that our memories are unreliable? Now, that's really just asking the students for an opinion. We want to go beyond that. So then we also ask, what are the strongest and weakest reasons that support the writer's opinion? So now we're asking the students to analyze arguments. Uh, so no matter what you're having them read or watch or listen to, you can always ask them a question like this. Ask them, what, are the, what reasons does the writer give and which reasons are strong and which reasons are weak? Which are the, and then ask them, are there other reasons uh, that the writer could have given uh, that would have helped uh, support the argument better. Uh, and then we see here in question two, uh, this is a very interesting uh, idea from the reading text. It's talking about something called a memory pill. Uh, scientists are actually developing uh, a pill that will uh, erase uh, bad memories uh, from your brain. Uh, so the question asks for personal opinion. Would you ever want to use the memory pill uh, described in the article. Maybe you had a bad day at work and just want to come home, pop a memory pill, and forget all about it. Uh, so that's just asking for a personal opinion. But again, we want to go beyond that. Uh, we want students to see both sides of the argument. So what we ask is, make a list of advantages and disadvantages of this drug. Uh, and this is something you can add to almost any question 
uh, any discussion question uh, that will automatically cause your students to give the kind of ideas and do the kind of critical thinking uh, that university teachers expect. By asking them what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages, uh, they're seeing both sides of the issue and not just giving their uh, personal views. And we see the same thing in question three. Uh, imagine that humans have perfect memories. Uh, would the world be a better place? Make a list of advantages and disadvantages. Okay, uh, so those are really the, uh, those are the main areas that I wanted to uh, talk to you today. Uh, there are three plus skills uh, in addition to the three basic skills um, that you can use to help your students be successful uh, in the academic university uh, classroom. There's critical reading in addition to basic reading. Uh, there's active listening uh, in addition to basic listening. And then in addition to understanding lectures, uh, you can do things to support your students uh, so that they're going to participate uh, successfully and effectively in university classes. Uh, I know there were a lot of questions that I wasn't quite able to get to, uh, but uh, we have a few minutes now. so. Uh, if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to try my best uh, to answer them now. Uh, and if there are any that I can't answer, I'm sure uh, some of you out there could add in. Okay, uh, Ilmer asked, should we give, also give students academic vocabulary? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of academic vocabulary lists out there. Uh, the skillful course is actually based on uh, something called the academic key list from the University of uh, Louvain in Belgium. And uh, all of the reading and listening texts are very rich in academic vocabulary. Uh, and we actually have some boxes uh, after each uh, reading and listening text uh, that calls out some of the most important academic vocabulary uh, so that over time your students will build up uh, those, uh, their uh, confidence with those very important words. Uh, can we see slide 30 again? Is that this one? Okay, great. Uh, and also, I believe that Macmillan will share these slides with you uh, shortly after the presentation. I don't know if we can give them to you immediately, uh, but in the next few days, uh, we'll certainly be able to either send you the slides or share uh, a link to the slides. I'm not quite sure how we'll do it, but um, you'll definitely have your own copy of the slides. Okay, any other thoughts? Uh, somebody just asked, I didn't quite see, but it said something about what reading or listening texts should there be. Um, I think, uh, you know, your students need to get used to reading and, and listening to academic texts. Uh, so I think the more you can do uh, that actually come from, for example, real textbooks, college textbooks, uh, or real academic journals that are at your student's reading level, uh, that would be excellent. Um, for listening text, I think it's a, a lot of the same thing. Uh, your students need to be getting used to actually listening to lectures. Um, so I know that podcasts and TV shows and clips and things are fun, and I think it's good to have some of that too, uh, because they'll also be seeing that in college as well. But it's also important for them uh, to be getting exposure to real academic language as it actually do, is used. Uh, what to do when students are undisciplined and unmotivated at all. Uh, that's a topic for another webinar. Uh, I think at the level of academic English, um, students, you know, if students are motivated to go to the next level uh, and be in an English language university environment, then I think they'll have that motivation. Uh, if students are there because it's a required class, you do need to make different choices about what, about the topics that you uh, work on them and the sorts of texts that you have them listen to and also the activities that you do uh, because you know that motivation is important. Um, it really is a subject for another time and actually this is something we've talked about uh, in other webinars. Uh, but really, if students can relate to the topic that you've set for them, uh, they're going to be more motivated than if they don't relate to the topic. So that's one thing uh, that you can do right from the start uh, that will help a lot. 
Okay, well, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, you've been fantastic, and I'm really, really grateful to you uh, for coming today and sharing your ideas with me and listening to me. Uh, and of course, thanks very much to Macmillan uh, and to Henry for setting all this up. Uh, and if any of you want to continue the conversation with me, uh, I've put just a few ways on the screen that you can get in touch with me uh, on my website uh, or Twitter or Facebook. So uh, if you use those services, I'd be very happy to uh, continue the conversation with you. Uh, so at this point, I think uh, I'm going to turn things back over to Henry. But again, thank, all, thank you so much uh, for just participating today. And I hope you all uh, have wonderful success with your students. And I look forward to continuing the conversation with you uh, in the future. So have a great day, everyone. Yep, uh, thank you, Mike. I can see from the feedback in the chat box that you all found that talk um, very useful and interesting today. Uh, it's another great webinar. So um, the certificates, I've already seen there's been a few questions about those. Um,